All right, welcome back to The Influencer. I am really, really excited to have our guest today. I'm gonna kind of introduce him to you guys in just a second. And I know I start off every show with uh, talking about how excited I am about the guest. However, today I have the guy that's responsible for bringing me into the real estate business. I have my first mentor uh, with me. This guy's been in the business for 18 years. He is, uh, he runs one of the top real estate teams in the world, selling over a thousand homes a year. And he's still personally selling over 150 homes a year himself. And so with me today, I've got Mr. Jeff Glover. Jeff, thank you so much for being on the show today. Appreciate you having me on, Brandon. Thank you. Absolutely. So what I want to talk about today is, uh, how to become a top listing agent in this crazy business of real estate that you and I are both in. Sure. You know, I think a lot of agents want to learn how to become a listing agent. They want to learn how to take listings. Yeah. Uh, for a lot of reasons, they're not able to do that. And I thought that you being one of the top listing agents in the entire industry in the world, there'd be nobody better to help our audience kind of understand and learn. So if you guys are watching this live, make sure you're ready to take some notes. Jeff is going to give you a ton of good information uh, that you can learn from, as I have from him over the past uh, probably five, 10 years in the business. So, yeah. again, Jeff, thanks for being here. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, yeah, I, I, and, and I don't have any kind of formal notes or anything like that. And if we can do a little Q&A back and forth. But really, what, what I think uh, is important to point out that, that agents need to know uh, especially agents that that want to be a listing agent, it really comes down to um, one word that comes to mind, honestly, and the word is decision. And uh, when I say decision, what I mean is you, you are making a decision that you're going to be a great listing agent no matter what. And I know, you know, I'm sure people watching are not saying, oh, we don't need any rah-rah, we don't need any motivation, but really, it, it really has to do with making the decision that that's what you're going to focus on and that's going to be who you are. And what's amazing about that is when you make the decision to be a great listing agent, the rest of the business comes easy, right? The buyer sales come easier. The buyer consultations become easier. The showing of homes becomes easier. When you make a decision that that's who you are, uh, you're, you're that much closer to becoming that. And I think that's the biggest mistake that agents make. And again, I know it sounds so basic, no one makes the decision, not enough agents make the decision that they're going to be a great listing agent. Here's what they do, Brandon. They say, you know what? Um, yeah, I love, I love working buyers and I'm, I'm pretty good with buyers, but I'd, I'd like to be a good listing agent too. You know, I'd like to take more listings this year. Uh, you know, it'd be great if I could take a handful more listings this year, you know, with listing inventory being so scarce. Yeah, I'd like to take a dozen listings this year, right? No one actually makes the decision to say, you know what, no matter what, I'm a listing agent and I'm a great listing agent and I'm going to focus on being a listing agent. What's amazing when you actually make the decision to being a great listing agent, all of a sudden, as long as you spend time thinking about it, you start having ideas and things come to you of things you can do to be a good listing agent. Well, if I'm going to be a good listing agent, then I need to master my presentation. If I'm going to be a good listing agent, then I have to have a plan of action that people get excited about and why they want to hire me. If I'm going to be a good listing agent, then I have to be able to master the objections because I'm going to be competing with the best of the best. If I'm going to be a good listing agent, then I have to know pricing and be the ability to price a property. If I'm going to be a great listing agent, I have to understand where my leads are going to come from, right? All of your energy and focus is, is on the listing process and the listing uh, lead generation. And, and so it really starts with, I don't, I don't know how else to explain it other than that's the biggest mistake that agents make. Everyone says they want to be a listing agent. Everyone says they want to take more listings. Everyone says they'd like to get their unfair share, but not many. I mean, literally probably less than one or 2% of the agent population actually make the decision to put all their eggs in the listing basket right? That every, not many put make the decision to say, you know what? I'm going to master sellers. You know what? I mean, think about it, right? It's not every day. It, who wakes up and says, man, I can't wait to get beat up by sellers on price. Man, I can't wait to get beat up with these objections. I can't wait to get hung up on. Man, I'm so excited to, to be told to, 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 to take a hike or, or to be porched <laughs> or, you know, all the things that happen when you're a listing agent. Man, I can't wait for all that stuff to happen. No one wakes up and says that. And the reality is, is the one or two that do end up succeeding at a high level because 
so few people actually make the decision to be a great listing agent. I love it. I love it. Well, you know, and that's a, a great segue. I've got a couple of questions that, that people have, have uh, wanted me to ask you, right? And I think this will really help the audience. We've got about 5,000 people watching live right now. I'm just kidding. We got 50, but that's still a good audience. <laughs> but you know what? With Facebook Live, you never know. It lives on for a little while. That's, that's right. So the first thing I want to talk about, Jeff, is, you know, I think one of the, the things that you and I both would agree on is agents are in a constant chase for the path of least resistance. They want to become a listing agent with the yeah. least amount of pain. And there's a big debate around marketing versus prospecting. Mm -hmm. Now, if anybody's followed you over your career, you built your business through prospecting. It wasn't only till later that you started spending money, but people only know the Jeff Glover as today. They see all the marketing you're doing and they're getting very distracted. They're saying, Brandon, well, you know, Jeff spends all this money on marketing. Can yep. you help them understand that they have to prospect first before they start yes. spending money? Yeah. So as, as crazy as this sounds, and take it from me because I've lost a lot of money on marketing. <laughs> I've made a lot of mistakes on marketing. Take it from me. The marketing, even to this day, Brandon, you'll appreciate this. The marketing actually only enhances everything else we do, right? So people think that because we started TV and billboards and all this, like, oh my God, once Jeff did billboards, his business exploded. We were doing 650 units annually before we, we spent a dollar on any mass marketing. And quite honestly, the only reason why we went from 650 to maybe 800 or so the next year, and then we got up to 1,000 the year after that, was because we had more agents that were making lead generation efforts. And don't get me wrong, um, the marketing definitely helps with conversion. You know, people, people say all the time, well, how do you track, you know, with so many billboards, you know, how do you track results? Well, there's direct and there's indirect, right? Direct is, hey, Jeff, we saw you on a billboard. We want you to list our house. Well, that's only a small percentage of our transactions. I mean, quite honestly, it's probably like 10, 15%. Where the marketing and the advertising helped is it took what we already, the foundation that we laid and enhanced it, right? So, you know your numbers very well, I'm sure. You know that if you contact 10 for sale by owners, let's just say, because I know that's that's your cup of tea. If you contact 10 for sale by owners, you know your numbers. You're setting two appointments, you know, or you're setting three appointments, you're going on two and you're getting one out of every 10. I'm just using round numbers. Well, when we started doing mass advertising, we could take those 10 for sale by owners and now we're setting four appointments instead of three, right? And now we're going on two, uh, uh, you know, instead of one, and now we're taking two instead of one, right? Like, so it enhances everything we're doing. And, and, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but our, our unit count was around 650 units and just over a million and a half in GCI, gross commission income, before we spent one dime on mass advertising. Now, I, I did have a little bit of a Zillow spend. So, you know, I'm not going to mislead and say we weren't spending some money. We were spending money with Zillow, but not, not uh, an astronomical amount. I mean, you know, when Zillow first came out, 2011, 2012, I mean, all you needed to spend was a few hundred bucks and you'd be okay, right? So we were spending a little money on Zillow, but that was it. We got to 650 units by lead generation, by prospecting, by knocking on doors, by picking up the phones and talking to people. It, it wasn't until we added the advertising layer on top of that to where our business exploded. But quite honestly, it, it didn't explode. I mean, we went from 650 to 800. Prior to that, I went uh, before 650, I think I was at around 550. So I could have found other ways to do it. It just made sense given the amount of revenue we were generating. So, uh, no, I appreciate you bringing that up because, yeah, a lot of people think, oh, overnight success. I mean, um, you know, I, I may look young, but I've been doing this 17, 18 years, right? I've been on the ground selling for 17, 18 years. So the foundation was really strong before we added any any sort of, of, of marketing on top of that. That's great. Thank you for clarifying that. And then the other thing, Jeff, is... So I agree, right? So uh, as I train agents now and, and I'm building my business, you know, I try to treat, uh, train agents and help them understand the foundation is prospecting. Once you have revenue coming in from prospecting, because it's all pure profit, then you can spend a, a portion of that money into marketing. But the problem that I have, Jeff, because my next question is this, how do you get agents that don't come from a sales background into this industry understand how important prospecting is because I have agents all the time say, you know what, I'm just, I'm not going to cold call. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. How have you gotten people to understand the importance of prospecting, to, to start prospecting, to get over that fear of prospecting? Yeah. 
So, and, and it is a real fear. And by the way, I'll, I'll, let me start off by answering with, uh, you can be a successful real estate agent. You can be a, a big successful real estate agent without ever cold calling, without ever picking up the phone and calling for sale by owner and expired. There's no doubt. The challenge is, is are you going to be able to sustain the amount of income that comes in in year one, in year two, in year three, in year four, because it's going to take you that much longer to be a success. And the reality is that's why the failure rate is so high in this business. So to answer your question, it's, it's educating agents on the chances of their success, uh, what the best of the best are doing to succeed and, and how long it would take to experience results, right? Like if you made the decision that yeah, I want, I want to be a salesperson. Jeff, teach me how to be a salesperson. Well, I'm going to tell you that it's going to take three to six months for you to become a strong salesperson. But then right away, you know, month seven, you can have eight, 10 listings. Month, month eight, you can have eight, 10 listings. It takes off like that. Where if you go the route like most agents do of building an online brand or, or playing around on Facebook and making cool Canva images or maybe some cool Instagram shots, uh, or, or sitting in open houses, you could be a big success doing all of those things, by the way, don't get me wrong. It's just going to take you several years versus someone that can learn how to sell in three to six months. And the gap there, right? Three to six months versus several years. Most people can't handle the, 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 the dip in income if they're coming from another career or lack of income. If, if, if this is their only career that takes place in year one, two, and three, before they get to that level where some of the branding and marketing and farming and things start to take off. That's a great, great point. And I agree. I mean, this isn't to say that people can't be successful doing all these other things. I think Jeff and I both agree that prospecting is, uh, yeah, the path of most resistance, but it's yeah. the most um, profitable and it's the quickest way to build a listing-based business. Yeah. And so much so that my first month in the business was with you, Jeff, at your office in Plymouth, Michigan, yeah. where you have an ISA team. And I took 20 Perfect. listings my first month. Look, it's, there it is. It's been remodeled. <laughs> but oh, it, looks, it looks nice. <laughs> it's been remodeled. You remember the old office, I'm sure. That's right. <laughs> um, but at my first month in the business, first 30 days as a realtor, I took 20 listings uh, with Jeff on Jeff's team. Now, I didn't know how to price property. Most of them expired. Yeah. I, I don't think any of them sold. <laughs> no, yeah, that's right. None of them sold. Hey, and you know what? I wasn't going to stop you from taking those listings because <laughs> you have to experience that repetition. You have to yes. experience the, the, the art of overcoming objections and getting a contract signed and coming back and writing a listing on the board. You got to feel and experience all that in order to, to, to get that momentum going, right? So, I, I mean, right. uh, same thing when new agents are starting off. Uh, they're not setting the best appointments when they start off. But you know what? We're not necessarily correcting them on that. You know, a lot of teams out there have ISA teams. We're letting them set weaker appointments when they start off because they need to feel uh, that sales process. And and you definitely uh, picked up on the sales process very quickly and had a lot of success early on. Yeah, that's what I always say to my students too, is the learnings in the doing, right? I can sit up here on stage and talk to you for hours, but until you do it, you're not going to really learn. So right. next question, talk to the audience about uh, a successful daily schedule of a top listing agent, someone that can earn half a million dollars a year, million dollars a year selling houses. What does that schedule need to look like? Yeah. So um, I'm going to answer that two ways. So number one, um, we used to, Brandon, and you probably remember this when we wrote out your first business plan. We used to ask agents to uh, put together a schedule from the time they get up until the time they're at home with their family. And the reason for that is, is because number one, we wanted to make sure that they were doing their income producing activities in the morning and that they were doing their income servicing and appointments in the afternoon. And so as time went on, what one thing we learned, and I say time went on, I mean, gosh, it's probably been, you know, 10, 12 years since we originally started holding agents accountable to a schedule. What we realized is that we didn't need to monitor and track and hold accountable what agents do after lunchtime so long as they have a strict morning schedule and they're sticking to it every single day. So um, our, our recommendation moving forward now is just to have a strong morning routine. We, you, you may have heard me talk about, you know, own the morning and win the day. If you can own the morning, you're going to win the day. It doesn't matter what happens in the afternoon. And the morning needs to be completely focused on lead generation, lead follow-up, generating new business. I don't care how busy you are right now. I don't have, care how big your listing inventory is. I don't care how many buyers you're showing homes to. Every day you come in at a certain time. It could even it can be seven o'clock, it can be eight o'clock, it can be even nine a.m. or ten a.m. I don't care what time you come in, but you do the same thing at the same time every morning, right? 
I don't care what time it is, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 9 a.m. I do this every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 930. I do this every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. If the morning schedule is consistent every half hour or every hour, well, then guess what ends up happening? The afternoon schedule becomes consistent with activities such as appointments gone on, showings, closings, inspections. And so um, I've never believed that, that, and I've never been a believer that closings and things like that should happen in the morning because if, in, unless you're going to have a closing every morning at 9 a.m., <laughs> right, uh, yeah. then you're not scheduling closings in the morning. You pick something, you know, whether it's uh, uh, following up on Zillow leads or prospecting for sale by owners, whatever, you have a set time that you do that at every single day and that doesn't change. And, and, you know, you, you do income producing in the morning and income servicing and appointments in the afternoon, period. You do not, you not, you know, cross those. I don't, you know, even, even go, by the way, I, I, and I know a lot of our agents even are like, I can't believe, you know, Jeff's, you know, has that mentality on that. If I have a listing, if I have a seller that wants to meet with me to list their home on Thursday at 9 a.m., I won't do it. I can't do it. I have a set appointment at 9 a.m. to call for sale by owners, right? I have a set appointment at 9 a.m. to lead follow-up. So if they need the morning, it's going to have to be Saturday morning. I do not go on appointments in the morning at all. I have a set schedule and it doesn't change. And because of that, the amount of appointments I go on is consistent. Uh, the amount of listings I take is consistent. The amount of closings I have is consistent. And so uh, I can't stress enough. I don't care what it is, as long as it's lead generation and as long as it happens at the same time every day, um, you, you'll, you'll have, you'll have a, a very consistent income in this business. I love it. And you can say no to things like that because of the consistency. Yeah. You know, when I look back at top producers like yourself or how I grow my business, it all comes down to the consistency or the lack of. And the reason yeah. why you can say no to an appointment where most agents can't say no is because they don't lead generate on a consistent yes. basis. So they need that appointment. They can't yes. say no to that. They're like, Jeff, yeah. this is my only listing appointment this year. I'm not yeah. saying no to that. So there's a big thing with that. Watch this example. Have you ever set two appointments in one hour? Sure. Absolutely, right? You yeah. you can you you're not gonna set two appointments every hour, but there's yeah. been certain hours. Yeah, from eight to nine, I set two appointments today, whatever. There's certain hours that you set two appointments. So this is my mentality. Well, wait a minute. If I go out on this listing appointment at 9 a.m. on Thursday, then I might miss out on two others. So mm -hmm. I'm going and getting one, but I'm missing out on two. I'm actually losing one, right? That, right that's right. actually my mentality. So instead, mm -hmm. they get moved. If it has to be morning, then it's going to be a Saturday morning. Yeah, I think agents just have to really focus on uh, abundance versus scarcity. You know, so many agents in this business is like, how can I make the most amount of money doing the least amount of work where you have an abundance mindset? There's plenty of a business, plenty of appointments. So my next question is, you talked about accountability, right? And I think that you would agree with what I'm about to say. And that is the secret to high income, the secret to high personal achievement is through accountability, through um, whether that be a coach or a mentor or somebody in your life to hold you accountable. Now, people, as you know better than I probably, Jeff, people run to real estate by the droves from corporate America, thinking that real estate provides them freedom and no accountability, do whatever I want. They yeah. quickly find out that is the reason why people fail. And yeah. so how do you help somebody understand that the higher level of accountability they have in this business the higher income they'll make and making peace with that. That's the biggest thing is being okay with the accountability versus fighting it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. You've probably heard of the phrase, uh, discipline creates freedom. Uh, mm. and, and, and yeah, you're, you're, you're spot on. Um, you know, so many agents sit across the chair and say, Hey, I, I want to get in this business for the freedom and the flexibility and the ability to make my own hours and control my schedule. And my response is always the great thing about this business is you get to have all of that. Uh, there's only going to be one thing missing. Can I share that with you? What's that? Money. <laughs> You're not gonna, you can have all the freedom and flexibility. Why? You just won't have any income. So now don't get me wrong. Uh, this, this business does afford us the opportunity to say, hey, even though we missed it this year, unfortunately, hey, you know, it's, it's Tiger's opening day. You know, I'm not taking any appointments today, right? You, you do have that flexibility, but you can't be doing that every day. You can't be doing that every other day. So, so my response is, the more disciplined you are early on in your career, right? So I, I, I tell agents all the time, if you can be more disciplined than you've ever wanted to be, meaning I know you just said you got into this for freedom and flexibility. If you can actually throw that thought out the window 
For the first two to three years in your career, you can have all the freedom and flexibility you want later. You can have all the freedom and flexibility to say, you know what? I'm, I'm good on my listing inventory. I'm going to flip these buyers to a showing agent. You can say, you know what? I don't really feel like working this weekend. I got 11 listings in inventory. One or two of them are pending right now. A couple of them will probably sell. I'm going to take this weekend off. I'm going to go spend time with my family or whatever. You have the ability to do that, just not often in your first year or two or even three years. And so that, that's my response. That's kind of the compromise. You can have all that freedom and flexibility later if you have an extreme, the more extreme your discipline now, the faster you can get to the freedom and flexibility later. The, the, the less extreme the discipline, the longer you're going to have to kind of dance with this. You know, you see agents all the time. I'm, I'm a 24-7 agent. I work seven days a week. Well, you're always going to be working seven days a week if you don't have that extreme discipline up front. Love it. Love it. Well said. So, all right. Now, moving forward, the next part of building a listing agent business, uh, let's talk about lead sources, right? And so, you know, I think this is where a lot of agents get caught up. You know, I want the magic lead source. I want the magic script. You know, can you walk people through a simple uh, lead source plan where they could just focus on to get enough listings to do 30, 40, 50 listings a year? Yeah, well, this one might sound backwards um, to you because we haven't spent a lot of time together and it's completely the opposite of what I taught you early on. And that is uh, our number one source of business to, of listings today is from our database. And sure. that is an area, Brandon, where we really, we, we, we spent no time. I mean, you probably, if you recall the time we spent together, we probably didn't mention the word database one time. And it's amazing today because almost everything we do in our business plan revolves around how we can add value to our database, how we can add value to get more repeat and referral business. And so I'll tell you, that is a shift that I made, that I made in my business, right? If I look back at the last 17 years, you know, the first, the first probably six or eight were spent just cold calling expires for sell by owners prospecting. And then it was advertising layered on top of that, right? And then now our, 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 our most recent layer, which has been the last four years, has been database and sphere of influence and past clients and how we can add value. So um, if I could do it all over again, I would start with database. I would start with my sphere of influence. I would start with the list of 50, 100, 150, 200 people that I know and their circles and the people that they know. And I would add value to that group and do everything I can to generate listings from that source. Uh, I did it backwards. And, and um, you know, there's things that we learned, of course, through that process. But if I could do it all over again, I would have been better at, 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 at that group. I love it. And I couldn't agree more. You know, when I, when I teach and train agents now, that's like our, our first thing that we do as well, Jeff, just like you do. We put a database system in place first before we start yep. going after strangers. We start taking yeah. care of the people we're surrounded with. I love it. Yeah. Right, so let's talk about some skills-based things. So you're on the phone prospecting. This doesn't, doesn't matter if this is to a referral partner, divorce yeah. attorney, expired FISBO, probate. doesn't matter what the lead source is. What are you focused on, Jeff, when you are on the telephone with a prospect? What's going through your mind? As a top producer in this industry, what is your only thing you're focused on? Uh, honestly, and this, and this might sound cruel, this may sound insensitive, but this is my mindset and it's worked for me. And that is, if I don't convert this into an appointment, they're going to get a disservice from another agent. Love it. I love it. That's so awesome you're, my mentality. So if, you're, if, if, my yeah, belief is, is that if they're not setting an appointment with me, they're going to set an appointment with someone and get a worse experience. I love it. So if I hear what you're saying, you're saying that you're focused on the appointment, correct? Because one thing that I see, and I, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is I'm coaching agents, Jeff. The agents are so attached to the outcome. They're so attached to the listing. And I'm trying to coach agents to focus on the appointment first. Yeah. Would you agree yes. with that? Absolutely. Without question, the number one thing I focus on is I just got to get in front of them, right? Yeah. I got to get in front of them via Zoom. Well, well, now we can go see yeah. people now, but I got to get in front of them one way or another. I know if I can get in front of them, then I can understand their needs. I know my scripts inside and out. You know, we haven't talked a lot about that yet. I'm sure we'll get into that. I, I know what questions I'm going to ask them. I know the advice I'm going to give them. I know the answers to everything prior to even going out. I just got to get in front of them. So yes, everything revolves around getting in their doorstep. Love it. And that's exactly what I teach as well. So you, you kind of uh, preface that a little bit, but let's talk about some scripts and dialogues yeah. or some simple things, Jeff. I've got like my favorite appointment setting script. I'm sure you do too. 
What are some things that people can take away that are watching this to take in their business to help them set more face-to-face -face appointments? Well, I'll tell you right now, especially with COVID, a script that's working very well for us is, Brandon, if you knew that there were a financial advantage, in, now, by the way, this is a variation of an old script that's been around. It's just twisting it or, or, or putting the, the COVID spin, if you will, on it. And that is, Brandon, if you knew there was a financial advantage to making a move now, knowing full well you could do it safely, would you be interested in hearing how? Sure. If you knew that you could, that there was a financial benefit, a financial advantage by making a move now, knowing full well that you could do it safely, would you be interested in hearing how? I love it. I love right? it. And then of course, depending on the buyer or seller, then you take them down that path. And you know, one of the, one of the things I wanted to mention on a script like that or scripts in general, um, and, and it's something you pointed out, and I, I want to make sure I, I get this out because it's very important. Yes, we're prospecting for appointments, but above all, appointment, lead, whatever you want to call it, we prospect for motivation first, right? Mm. You prospect for motivation first, meaning the mistake a lot of agents make is they call every lead, every prospect with the same script. This is my for sale by owner script. This is my expired script. This is my Zillow script. And everything is designed to set an appointment. Well, guess what happens to all of the prospects that aren't ready to set an appointment right now because they're not motivated? You turn them off. So mm -hmm. if you're using an appointment setting script and you're not identifying someone's motivation quickly, then you've lost your chance at future business because you're probably being a little too strong with them. Where on the other side of that, if I've got someone who's super motivated and, and they're ready to do something now and I'm not strong enough, I'm not closing for an appointment, they're also going to be turned off because they, you know, motivated and, 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 and excited prospects want a motivated, hungry, excited agent. So if I have someone that's motivated, then I better take them down the path of setting the appointment. If they're not motivated, then I have to go down another path of, of just creating a lead, a future follow-up or something like that. So it's very important before you make a decision to go in for the appointment, you have to identify their motivation first. So prospect for their motivation first and then decide what path you're going to take them down. Love it. This is probably the one part, this will be a little bit, this will be fun for the audience. This will be the one part that I think that you and I see differently. And that is this. I am under the belief at this point in my career that a face-to-face -face appointment um, changes everything. A face-to-face -face appointment, an agent will uncover motivation that they can't over the telephone. So what I train agents to do, which I'm sure is a little different than what you believe, Jeff, is get that face-to-face -face appointment, regardless if you hear the motivation or not, because what happens is, as an example, FISBOs all the time, they'll tell me, Brandon, I'd rather cut my arm off than pay you a commission. Yeah. I go on that appointment and I get a 6% commission listing yeah. all the time. And agents so, shut down and agents shut down when they hear I'd rather right. cut my arm off. That's right. So, so I know you, you come from the school of thought and me too, right? So I was in Mike Ferry coaching. You, you were a big Mike Ferry guy before launching your own company. And we were taught pre-qualify, pre-qualify, pre-qualify. Do not leave your office until that thing's pre-qualified. I changed that. When I changed that, my business went through the roof um, because we got face-to-face -face with a lot more prospects. And when we got face-to-face, -face, Jeff, we learned that what they were telling us over the phone was just all smoke screens. They just didn't want to talk to the salespeople over the phone. What would you say to that? What is your thought on that approach? So, um, by the way, I appreciate that approach. In fact, we're not too far off. Um, I, I've been telling agents for years that um, you pre-qualify every appointment before you go out unless, unless you're not going to stay back and lead generate. And so I'm strong with my pre-qualifying because Brandon, I know if I sense something, and by the way, when, I, when I'm getting objections, I'm not sensing, I'm not making my decision whether I'm going to go or not because they told me that, that they'd cut their arm off if they, if they had before they'd pay a commission. I'm listening for their ability. I'm listening for their motivation. I'm listening for their time, time frame, their timeline, right? So I'm listening for those things. And my mentality is this, if, if I don't like what I hear in two or three of those areas, I'm going to stay back and find a better one. I'm going to stay back and prospect for another 60, 90 minutes because watch this. It was already blocked off for an hour in your schedule, right? Let's just say, you know, the average appointment is 45 minutes, whatever. It was already blocked off for an hour. You probably have a 20 to 30 minute drive there and a 20 to 30 minute drive back, right? 
So yeah. in theory, I've got two hours committed to this particular prospect. Well, I know if I spend one hour in lead generation, I'm going to either set an appointment or create a great lead. So if I think that I could find a better appointment or a better lead versus spending time with this particular prospect because their motivation isn't that high or the ability isn't that strong or their time frame isn't time soon, anytime soon, then I may make the decision to stay back and find a better appointment. The reason why I, I like your approach is because the average agent is not going to stay back and find an appointment. The average agent is just better off going out and getting on one. I know I'm going to stay back and find a more motivated one. So that's why I would still endorse my method if you had the motivation and the discipline to stay back. And I'm not even saying you got to stay back for two hours, right? You were already committed for two. So cut it in half, stay back for one hour or for 90 minutes and find a better one for tomorrow or for later this evening or the next day or the weekend. Um, but that, that, so we're, we're of the same school of thought there unless you have the discipline to stay back and find another one. Cause if you stay back and find another one, well, well, Agent A from ABC Realty is out meeting with a semi-motivated for sale by owner. I just I just plucked a brand new for sale by owner that's motivated to sign tonight or tomorrow, right? So that that's that's my thought process on that. Yeah, yeah, really, really good point, and I love the philosophy. And this is I just like masterminding with you. You know, this is really really cool stuff. So, all right, now let's move on to follow up, right? I think we both would agree that uh, follow up, whether that be database or whatever the lead source is is where a lot of agents are missing the boat and it's where most of the business is to be had. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've heard for years, 60 to 70% of your appointments are going to come in the lead follow-up. That's right. That's right. So really quick, can you walk people through kind of what you've done over the years uh, as a lead follow-up strategy to turn leads into appointments, into listings? Yeah. So uh, I'm going to answer this three ways and I'm going to answer it with the way that I know best I'm going to answer the way that I'm doing it now. Uh, and then I'm going to answer with the way that I recommend others do it if they can't do it the way I'm doing it now. All right. So my first response is for years and years, Brandon, you may remember this. I carried with me two folders. All right. One folder, and they were always tattered because I carried them with me everywhere. One folder had a big zero written on it and a dash number seven. It was just a basic manila folder. And I had another folder that had seven dash 30. Well, inside of those folders was in the zero to seven folder, everyone that I thought would be hiring an agent within the next week or going out and looking at homes within the next week, meaning these guys are hot to trot. The seven to 30 folder was everyone that was going to be doing something, probably not this week, but in the next couple of weeks or within the next 30 days. And I would carry that folder with me everywhere. In the zero to seven group, they'd get something from me every day, a text, a call, an email, something. That, that group is highly motivated. Remember, motivated prospects love motivated agents. So the seven to 30 group, I'd probably go into that folder a couple, three times a week maybe. But I would carry those two folders every, everywhere. And, and in those folders was a one-page lead sheet. You probably remember our seller and buyer lead sheet. Still use it's it today. Funny. I was going to say, I've seen them circulate around our market. Everyone's got them with their own logos on it, which is cool, whatever. Uh, yeah. I, by the way, I, I, we just took one and, and recreated it anyways. Um, so so I've, got, I've got these folders with all these lead sheets in them. Now, obviously, fast forward to 2020. We have CRMs. You know, we, have, we have apps. We have things that notify us of things. Um, I'm still a little old-fashioned. Uh, you know, even being 35, I'm going to be 36 in, in a week or so. Um, I'm still, uh, I still like the paper stuff. So my process now is our operations team has things set up on reminders and they use our CRM to notify them of this. And they come, they come in each morning and say, Jeff, here are your calls for today. Right? So it's basically like handing me and it's, it's such a pain in the neck because they pick on me because they literally have to type it into the CRM and then print it off for me. Right? Cause right. I don't go into my phone and grab it or whatever. And they come in and they hand me my calls for the day. And guess what I do now, Brandon? I just carry that stack with me every single day. And then the next morning when I come in the office, I hand it back to them and say, here's what happened with these seven. Here's what happened with these three. Here's what happened with these 10. And I hand it back with them. Uh, now, so that, that's how I do it now. Uh, if you don't have staff or you don't have an operations team or whatever, then you would obviously utilize your CRM and make sure you're utilizing reminders and that you're doing it at the same time each and every day and that your reminders are going off at the same time each and every day. Um, the, the, it's crucial that it becomes a habit and it becomes a routine. Yeah. That, so here's the deal. That's probably, if I look back at it, you've taught me a lot of things. 
That one thing has stuck with me today so much so it's what I teach. I'm old school too. I think CRMs, there's all kinds of reports coming out nowadays that CRMs are making people less productive. So I still run my Manila folder system, right? I've got one of my hottest leads. I've got one of my long-term nurture, so on and so forth. My students know my whole folder system. A lot of that came from you. And there's so much to be said when you touch and feel these, these paper leads because yep. they have meaning behind them. And so I think agents are getting lost in their CRM. They're losing thousands of dollars in commissions because they're yeah. playing on the CRM. They're, they're spending too much time in it. Yep. Yeah, right. absolutely. If there was, uh, uh, if, and, and, and again, that, that's why I don't touch it. Uh, g- go in and get me what I need to do each day and hand it to me. And that, that's my focus. I love it. I love it. All right, let's move on to the presentation. I know we don't have that much more time with you. Uh, so I want to make the most of it. So now, so, so now we prospected, we're setting appointments, we followed up. Let's talk about the presentation. Yeah. So what are some quick tips that you can talk about at the presentation that helps you win the business most of the time? Well, one of the biggest things, and you, you know this because we taught you our listening presentation early on, is, is making sure that you're controlling the presentation by asking a ton of questions. Uh, right. the, 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 the person that does uh, the talking, right? There's two, we say this, there's two salespeople at every presentation. The customer is selling you on all the reasons why they don't want to sign right now, or why they have to interview other agents or whatever the objection is. And the realtor is convincing them to sign. Okay, here's the deal. The person that does the most talking is generally the weaker of the two. So that being said, I want to control the conversation by asking a series of questions, right? I, I, don't get me wrong. I'm building rapport while I'm there, but I'm asking a series of, of very scripted questions. And um, I'm keeping the appointments to 30 or 35 minutes. Um, I, I, if, if we get into, you know, if they want to know what I'm going to do to sell their house, we have a plan of action that we present to them. And of course, the plan of action does have to be strong. It does have to be unique. Uh, but for the most part, it's, it's focusing on them and their goals, their needs, their wants, their whys, their hows, their timeline, their time frame, and focusing on that and, and putting a plan together to, to help them accomplish it. I mean, I know, I know it's more complicated than it sounds because there is something to be said about mastering scripts, which by the way, I'm sure you have some great scripts. If you want, I can share with you, um, you know, all of our scripts. If you're, if you're, if you or your people just text the word scripts to three, three, seven, 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 you'll have access to all of them. Three, three, seven, seven, seven is, um, by the way, even that system, I don't know if you use a system similar to that. When they first told me that, I'm like, well, that's not seven digits. <laughs> how does that How does that send out? 33777, and it's scripts, plural. Uh, but that's that's our listening presentation. That's our buyer consultation. Those are objection handlers. That's everything. And we've updated them, obviously, throughout the years. But um, it, it needs to be very scripted. And I know people are kind of afraid of scripts. Our scripts are old-fashioned. Old it's 2020. What are you guys doing talking about scripts? At the end of the day, as long as we still have buyer consultations and listing presentations, we're going to be meeting with people. And if we're going to be meeting with people, then we're going to be talking to them. And if we're going to be talking to them, then we have to ask a series of questions in a particular order that lead to response. That's why scripts are set up the way they're set up. They're designed to get you to the to the yes, to the close, to the signature. Love it. Could not agree more. I mean, it's amazing why salespeople want to talk so much. We need to be asking more questions And what I always try to focus on is where's the pain? When there's pain with the prospect, then you can provide a solution. Then you can bring the client, right? All right, so cool. Last couple of questions, Jeff. Again, thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah. The mindset, okay? So you're known uh, in this industry for pushing through pain. You you know, a lot of people, a lot of people refer to you as like machine-like because your first couple of years, you were able to prospect and push through all the rejection and push through all the, uh, you know, being young in the business, there's a lot of things going against you. Mm-hmm. I am under the belief, Jeff, that once when people come from pain or they put themselves in pain, that's the fastest way to succeed. So what do you see? You see a lot of agents, a lot of agents at your company, in your training business, in your coaching company, at your team, a lot of agents coming out of the business. What are the things that you see that uh, helps agents succeed and some common traits that, that put agents into failure. And what is that mindset that it requires people to succeed in this business? Well, um, it, it, it boils down to this, this, this statement right here. Um, the more rejection I get, 
the more success I have, period. The more I put myself in situations where I can be rejected at a high level, the greater chance I have of succeeding at a high level. And um, without, at the risk of sounding cliche, right? Everyone's taking the path of least resistance. So the few that are taking the path of most resistance are the one having the success. And that, that is the truth. Um, I, I meet so many agents in this business, uh, you know, and I shake their hand and they introduce me how they're doing. And I'm thinking to myself, you're going to need more mental toughness than that. You're going to need more mental toughness than that. This business, if you want to succeed at a high level as a listing agent, well, listen, let's, Let's not poo-poo the idea that there's a lot of great agents out there, four, five, six, seven, 10, 15, 20, 30 million dollar producers that never had to become a salesperson, right? They did it because of marketing or they did it because of leads or they did it because they have a great open house or they put on great client events. Don't get me wrong. You can succeed at all of those things. It just won't happen as fast and it won't happen as high of a level as learning to become a strong salesperson. And part of being a strong salesperson is that mental toughness. Love it. What, what gives you that internal fire? How are you able to fight through? Because here's the reality, right? I mean, I, I have so much respect for what you've done, Jeff. And you've, you could have stopped a long time ago. You know, you, you made a lot of money. You, 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 you seem like you've created a, this awesome lifestyle. Why not just stop, call it a day and say, this is good enough. You keep, you keep striving for greatness. How is it that you have that? And how can other people get it? I mean, this, this boils down to probably the training part of me and the coaching part of me. Um, and I'm sure this drives you crazy too. And one thing I appreciate about you, Brandon, which is different than most out there is I, I am, I am tired of hearing and seeing all of the real estate trainers and coaches mm -hmm. in the industry, the experts in the industry, give advice to realtors, to follow my plan, buy my system, sign up for this. And, and they're not proven. They haven't done anything. Or if they did, it was decades ago. And um, I, I know this sounds crazy, but I, I, I hate the fact that my real estate business in terms of like Jeff Glover and Associates and, and, and the franchise Keller Williams that I'm affiliated with, I hate the fact that I'm only in Michigan. I don't feel like I can impact enough people just here. So, I mean, that was part of the, the inspiration for Glover U. I'm not going to be able to impact you know, thousands upon thousands and hopefully millions one day, unless I do something nationwide. And, and I don't know about you, it just drives me crazy to see agents. Oh, you got to go hear that person speak. They're a great speaker. You got to go hear them. They're a great presenter, but it's like, that's not the truth. That's not, that's not real. That's not going to work. Right. Like, uh, and that's the thing. I'm not even coming up with new concepts. <laughs> I'm just sharing what I'm doing. Right. So that's probably why I'm one of the boring ones. Cause Oh yeah, Jeff, he'll just tell you to work hard, follow a schedule and learn how to sell. Cool. What else? Right. I'm just sharing with, with, with people what I'm doing. Right. And it, I think it's a little different versus theories and concepts and go to this program. Cause they'll teach you how to do this. And it's like, what is the definition of success volume units? No, it's, 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 it's the money that you keep and what you do with that money, right? What you invest and what you do for your family and what you, how you give back and how you donate and right. Like that's, that's what it's all about. And unfortunately there's not enough people that have done it uh, that are qualified to talk about it. And, and, and it's my mission to not stop until we're impacting millions. Love it. I love it. All right. So when is your birthday, Jeff? June 6th. All right. So mine's May 30th. You're going to be what? 35, 36, you said? 36. Yep. 36. If the 36-year-old Jeff Glover can go back and talk to the 18-year-old Jeff Glover, knowing what you know now, what do you say to that kid? Um, don't think you have it all figured out. Learn to, to appreciate others and, and get to know others and uh, appreciate what makes other people tick because just because you believe one way doesn't mean that they see things that way. You know, I had a lot of struggles early on in, in versatility. And, you know, of course, being 18, making 150 grand a year, you think you got it all figured out. You know, you're you're like, man, I'm I'm going to college to learn how to make half of what my teacher is making, you know, or whatever. So um just just being more flexible, more versatile, uh, and and um learning what makes other people tick and, and not be so focused on my way or the highway type of thing. Love it. Love it. What's next for Jeff Glover and Associates? What's ne next for Glover U? What do your goals look like over the next couple of years? 
Well, so I'm still going to maintain at least 100 deals a year myself personally. Uh, I believe that's one of the things that makes us unique at Glover U and even at JGA and, and the agents that affiliate with us because I need to be the example. I, I can't stand up and say, here's, I never want to, I want to, I never, you'll never hear me say this. I, I hope, knock on wood. Well, back in my day, we used to. No, no, no. It's as long as I'm, as long as I'm talking and training, here's how I do it. Here's how I did it last night. Here's how I did it last week. So um, my, my big focus is, is setting a great example for, for our agents in, in our brokerages here in Southeast Michigan. And now we have Kalamazoo um, setting a great example for our team members at JGA and developing leaders who, who can now take what we've done and go out and duplicate it in, in, in other ways in, in, in their way. And of course, that all falls kind of under the funnel of Glover U because that Glover U just gives people access to what we're doing that aren't local, or maybe they don't want to affiliate with our company. You know, I know you've got a great organization. They want to, they want to be a part of your organization, but they, but they want the training or they want whatever. It gives anyone from any brokerage, independent franchise, the opportunity to get access to our stuff without actually transferring to our brokerage. I love it. And that's my last question for today, Jeff. If somebody wants to coach with you and they want to learn from you, where do they go to find out about Glover U, to sign up for coaching with you? How, how do they do that? I would say there's two places that I recommend. Uh, number one, we, we have the Glover U Inner Circle Facebook group, uh, which anytime I do a video or come up with a new script or, or hey, we did this with our team, you know, any, anytime I'm sharing stuff, we share it in there. Uh, so that's the Facebook group, Glover U Inner Circle. Um, obviously, if a lot of people listen to podcasts. We've got a podcast that comes out, you know, every week. And it's, it's, it's not always just interviews. It's, it's, you know, things I'm doing, Hey, this is what we did this week. You know, like today, for instance, we did uh, the post uh, post COVID business plan. Uh, so that's going to be on the podcast, you know, come next week. So um, I would say the podcast is the other place. And obviously if people have questions about coaching or any of that, GloverU.com. If you just go to GloverU.com, all of our programs and everything are right on there. Awesome. Well, Jeff, man, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed this and I'm sure yeah, a lot of people, um, got a lot out of today. And so maybe we'll do a follow-up in a few months. And yeah. man, thank you so much. Continue to inspire us because man, you, you keep uh, helping me level up and wanting to become a better leader in this business. So thank you so much for all that you do. Yeah, you bet, Brandon. People are uh, lucky to be working with you and uh, thanks for having me on. You got it, Jeff. Talk soon. All right. We'll see you.